few crossovers in history are as memorable and iconic as Marvel vs. Capcom. The epic series of fighting games that feature our favourite Marvel superheroes and villains facing off against many of Capcom's most legendary video game characters. In the last few weeks on this channel, we have already begun revisiting some of the classics from these games' lineage, including the unbelievable X-Men vs. Street Fighter, as well as its follow-up that added other heroes to the mix, Marvel Super Heroes vs. Street Fighter. Today, we shall cover the next exciting entry from this line of fighters, taking an up-and-close and personal look at the first video game to carry the Marvel vs. Capcom branding. So without further ado, hello ladies and gentlemen, Big Daddy Top Hat here. This is the story of Marvel vs. Capcom Clash of Superheroes, the most ambitious crossover event in history up until that point. Yeah. The year is 1998 and the partnership between Marvel and Capcom has been in full swing for quite a while. A combination of the outrageous mainstream success of Street Fighter 2 and Arcade, paired with Capcom's stellar job they did producing the Punisher beat-em-up arcade game, gave Marvel Studios enough confidence to allow for Capcom to produce an X-Men fighting game. X-Men Children of the Atom would be a fantastic game that introduced aerial combat and even a secret boss fight with Street Fighter's Akuma. Next, Capcom would make a Marvel Super Heroes fighting game featuring Spider-Man and company before moving on to the two epic crossover fighters we have already discussed recently at length. Which, at this point, brings us to the exact game we are going to be looking at in detail today. Marvel vs. Capcom Clash of Super Heroes. I noted previously that there was only a 10 month gap between the release of X-Men vs. Street Fighter and Marvel Super Heroes vs. Street Fighter, which is an incredibly small amount of time, even by cash-grabbing Capcom standards. But what you may find even more amusing is that there would be an even smaller window between Marvel Super Heroes vs. Street Fighter and Marvel vs. Capcom, with this time there being a mere six-month gap between entries, which is insane when you think about it. These crossovers were just some of the fighting games that Capcom were bringing out at the time as well, with Street Fighter Alpha 3, Street Fighter EX2 and JoJo's Bizarre Adventure all being examples of other Capcom published fighting games that saw release that year. All we seem to get from Capcom these days is a new Street Fighter game every 7 years or so, so it was clearly a very different time. So what did they do with Marvel vs Capcom to try and make it stand out from everything else they had on the market? Well, build on the crossover format of course. To expand on the crossover idea, since the previous game incorporated a roster of Street Fighter characters alongside fighters from the greater Marvel Universe, the next logical step in the series was to expand the roster on the Capcom side of things. This meant that this new game would include characters from other Capcom games, rather than just relying on the presence of Street Fighters. So with all of this in mind, let's start breaking this one down, starting with checking out the arcade games of track mode. Capcom presents. Capcom presents. That's some pretty epic hype to be fair, but what else could be expected of this series? From the initial character select screen, you will notice that this game initially offers 15 different playable characters, including the return of several from the previous games in the series. In terms of Street Fighters, Ryu, Chun-Li and Zangief all return, while Wolverine, Spider-Man, Captain America and the Hulk are all back on the Marvel side. On top of this, Gambit also returns for the first time since X-Men vs Street Fighter, a welcome returnee when we consider how popular this character is. If you suckers can count, you may have noted that I just listed off 8 fighters, meaning the other 7 characters are all brand new additions to this crossover series, and all in all decent additions they are, so let us briefly touch on each of them. On the Marvel side of things, there are only 2 new fighters though, so let us start off by covering those. Firstly, we have War Machine from the Iron Man franchise, which may or may not be a palette swap of Iron Man from the Marvel Super Heroes fighting game. Secondly, a much more exciting character was introduced, fricking Venom, 
one of my all-time favourite Marvel characters. If you grew up in the 90s, you will probably be able to recall what a huge deal Venom was, with this villain becoming highly popular through the success of the Spider-Man animated series on the Fox Kids Network. So, great choice there. When I first played this one as a youngster, Venom would instantly become one of my go-to choices as a result. But being another of Teddy Long's favourites, this game would feature tag team matches players, so I would get to select another fighter to team up with Venom. This brings me to my favourite Capcom addition to the game, Mega Man. In the words of Sheev Palpatine, this was a surprise to be sure, but a welcome one, as I never expected to see him included in a game like this. You see, Mega Man always felt particularly special to me, as I was always the only person at school who liked or had even heard of these franchise. Growing up in the UK, the NES was never a particularly popular platform, so most people missed his games during the 8-bit era. However, for me personally, the Mega Man X games were some of the crown jewels in my childhood Super Nintendo collection. Mega Man X on the Super Nintendo didn't sell very well, due to no brand recognition being built up in the region during Nintendo's 8-bit days. This meant that I felt like I was the only one in the world who loved the Mega Man, even though, from what I now know, he was massive in the United States and Japan. Seeing him amongst this star-studded lineup, I guess was really my first glimpse of what a big deal this character truly was. Being able to play as Venom and Mega Man against a cast of X-Men and Street Fighter characters felt like the craziest yet coolest concept for a game that had ever been conceived, and, retrospectively, I do not think I was wrong in my thinking either. To accompany Mega Man, we would also get the debut of Strider Hariu from the Strider Hack and Slash platforming series, Jin Sayatomi from the Cyberbots series, Captain Commando from the 1991 side scrolling beat em up, and of course Morrigan, who had built up a strong reputation and fan following through the awesome Darkstalkers series. Oh, what the? She's a goddamn succubus! Succubus trying to take my baby! On top of the 15 initial playable characters, the game also features a number of secret characters, a number of which are palette swaps, such as Shadow Lady, who is a variant of Chun Li, and Red Venom, who is a palette swap of Venom. A trope that was carried over from Marvel Super Heroes vs. Street Fighter. Roll is also present from a Mega Man series, who features the same moveset as Mega Man, however at least with this one, she features her own unique sprite. Outside of selectable characters though, there are actually even more in-game characters to talk about, however we shall get to the rest shortly. In terms of actually playing this game, many of the mechanics established in the previous Marvel and Capcom crossover games make a welcome return here. Expectedly at the game's heart, this is a traditional fighter, however several additional elements are included that enhance the action, including the good old tag team mechanics and aerial combat, which we have already touched on earlier in the video. Hyper combos are also back, however combat wise there is one major shift in gameplay. Remember the variable assists we talked about when covering Marvel Super Heroes vs Street Fighter, where the player could call upon their off-screen characters and perform a special attack? Well, this feature has been removed. Instead, we have in its place a guest character special partner system, which brings me on to talking about what guest characters actually are. To put it simply, on top of the characters we have already discussed, there are a further 20 which are known as guest characters. These include some pretty famous faces, such as Cyclops, Jubilee, Thor, and even bloody Arthur from Ghosts and Goblins. These characters are drawn upon for extra support during battles, and are randomly allocated to players prior to a fight. These can be called upon a few times per bout, and can be used when executing new techniques that made their debut in this game, such as variable crosses, aka the duo team attacks. A variable cross allows you to attack your opponent with both characters at the same time for a limited period, essentially double team manoeuvres. Building on the newness, the game features an all new soundtrack that mixes a range of entirely new melodies with remixes of long established tracks that have been featured in previous Capcom games. Along with the musical changes, the game also introduced all new stage backdrops, a hugely welcome change when you take into account that X-Men vs Street Fighter and Marvel Super Heroes vs Street Fighter lazily both included the same stages, despite being marketed as different games. In addition to the new fighting mechanics, Apocalypse and Cyber Akuma, who were end bosses in the previous game, have been removed. In their place is an all new final encounter against Onslaught to originate from the X-Men series. This fight with Onslaught is notorious for being amongst the most difficult bosses in fighting games, and is considered by many to be quite simply the hardest boss in the series. 
He can perform attacks that do colossal damage, many of which are inescapable. He has two challenging forms, the first of which is tall and highly evasive, the second of which can fly around the background and take up most of the screen. Despite his huge, ominous presence, only a small part of his body is vulnerable to damage, making this even more challenging. All in all, this arcade game includes plenty of new content that greatly separates Marvel vs Capcom to all the crossover games that came before it. But what for the console ports? Let's take a deep dive look. Now with previous entries in the series, they have been ported over to the Sega Saturn and Sony PlayStation, with the Saturn versions of the game massively outperforming the entries found on the PlayStation. By this point in time, Sega had released an all new home console in the form of a Sega Dreamcast. So this time around, Capcom had even more power at their disposal when bringing this arcade game home. The arcade version of the game, like its predecessor, was developed for the CP System 2 arcade hardware, with it being revealed that it would be ported over to the Dreamcast during the 1998 Tokyo Game Show. This version of the game would be particularly special, as it would feature a mode known as Cross Fever, which would allow up to four separate players to compete in the same tag team matches simultaneously. The Dreamcast version of the game, which was ported to the Dreamcast in 1999, would go on to receive rave reviews from journalists, such as GameSpot stating, Graphically, Marvel vs Capcom looks terrific, and once and for all proves that the Dreamcast can definitely do justice to 2D games. Even when four characters are on screen, filling the arena with projectiles, while the background goes crazy, the game doesn't slow down a bit. The utter lack of load times keeps the game moving along at a nice, brisk pace. The soundtrack, which comprises music from all sorts of different Capcom games, is unmatched. The game's sound effects are also crystal clear and extremely well done. The copious use of stereo separation helps make the audio perfect. While I wouldn't call Marvel vs Capcom the most balanced fighting game in the world, it makes up for its shortcomings by simply being a whole lot of fun. After pumping out inferior vs games for a few years now, Capcom have finally gotten it right. Marvel vs Capcom is everything you'd expect from an over the top, ultra flashy fighter and then some. IGN had equal praise for the game, particularly in the graphical department. They were very impressed with the game's art style and expressed this by saying, Everything from the way Venom moves his tongue to Gambit's trench coat blowing in the wind is done with such precision. That feast in your eyes upon it is more like experiencing a Saturday morning cartoon than a video game. At even the most frantic moments of combo madness, the backgrounds and characters move just as fluidly as they did before the insanity began. In fact, it's so visually orgasmic that I couldn't help but smile and smile big whenever something cool happened. 32-bit systems can't do this stuff, folks. IGN went on to praise all the modes of gameplay this version of the game includes, such as the return of survival mode and the introduction of Cross Fever. To summarise, they stated taking everything into consideration, Marvel vs Capcom is an excellent post-launch purchase. With the mini-glut of fighting titles available for the system by the end of October, this is definitely one of your better choices, if not the best. It's certainly the best 2D title on the system until Street Fighter Alpha 3 rolls into town, so don't pass this one up. So as demonstrated by the Dreamcast version of Marvel vs Capcom's universal praise, the game is not only arcade perfect, but offers a range of play modes that can only be experienced in this version of the game, arguably making this game better than what can be experienced in the arcades. Which to be frank was what the Sega Dreamcast was all about. The platform was far ahead of its time and in many ways more innovative than many systems that preceded it several years later. I'm looking at you Nintendo GameCube. Now moving away from the Dreamcast version of the game, we have to also touch on the PlayStation version. Yes ladies and gentlemen, in a world where we had the ultra slick, barely priced Sega Dreamcast available to experience at home, the majority of gamers skipped it and just stuck with the feeble PS1 instead. Fortunately, I was not one of those people, but a lot of people denied themselves the magic of the world's most powerful game console. So with most gamers of the age being tight-fisted and saving their money for the non-existent yet PS2, they stuck with the humble 32-bit PlayStation. With the PlayStation's user base being so large, Capcom's hand would be forced once again to create a port of their demanding 2D sprite-based game for a system that was generally terrible at handling them. We've already discussed at length when discussing X-Men vs Street Fighter and Marvel Super Heroes vs Street Fighter, 
about how the PS1 simply wasn't capable of holding four different sets of sprite animations for fighting game characters in its working memory simultaneously. This meant that one of the main draws of the series, being tag team matches involving four different beloved characters, simply wasn't possible on the hardware. But to be fair to Capcom, they would at least get better at producing PlayStation versions of these fighting games with each passing title, with Marvel vs Capcom being by far the most refined of the bunch. Additional familiar issues return such as certain characters having missing animation frames, long load times existing and of course a lack of proper tag action, but the game offers a lot more differences than it is often credited for. Known as Marvel vs Capcom Clash of Superheroes EX Edition in Japan, it carries the EX branding in the nation as it is essentially a different game to what can be found in arcades. Rather than simply just being a poor imitation of its arcade counterpart, it seems Capcom would try harder to make this game stand out and be different from the crossover games that had previously been ripped apart for the PlayStation by critics. As an EX game, the title obviously already had elements that separated it from its source game, most notably the one-on-one -on -one round based matches. For the bouts in this game, a number of mechanical changes were implemented to separate gameplay further, with differences added that an argument could be made were actually for the betterment of the port this time around rather than simply due to system limitations. In fact, some new features for the EX edition are so extensive it can be argued that this port served as a testing ground for mechanics and features that would later be a huge part of Marvel vs Capcom 2. The craziest example of this relates to the fact that the EX version of the game contains delayed hyper combos. DHCs would play an integral part in Marvel vs Capcom 2's play and describe when you cancel the super attack of your point character with a super from the next character. In this version of the game, fighters can also cancel hyper combos into another hyper combo, essentially meaning the whole experience gives players more things that they can do in combat to somewhat make up for the lack of tag team action. Due to this, there are a number of move combinations that can only be performed in this version of the game. For example, in the PlayStation port, Mega Man gets a secret third hyper combo based on his ending, Onslaught's Magnetic Shockwave. To use it, one has to win the game with him and then choose him while holding the select button. In fact, lots of examples can be found online of players performing all sorts of weird and wonderful attack combinations that can only be performed in this very specific version of the game. Further changes include a new zoom in effect when fighters perform air combos, a feature known as dynamic mode, which if players find too distracting, they can manually turn off. There are also more palette swaps on offer, allowing gamers to play as fighters in more different attires than in other versions. When we consider that the PlayStation version of the game was never going to fare as critically well as its Sega Dreamcast counterpart, it is really cool to go back and see that rather than just pushing out another underappreciated PlayStation conversion of a crossover game, Capcom appear to have used this moment as an opportunity to experiment with mechanics to utilise in the future resulting in a video game that offers something different than other EX crossover games that came before it. When it comes to Marvel vs Capcom reaching home systems, the 2D power class divide between Sega and Sony hardware was greater than ever, which makes it all the cooler to see that they went an extra mile with the PlayStation version to give it some saving graces over other iterations of the game. In my mind, Marvel vs Capcom Clash of Superheroes was another significant step forward in relation to the evolution of the Marvel vs Capcom series overall. This game was certainly the most ambitious crossover event in history to date, and a significant chapter in gaming history right up until this very day. This was after all the game that solidified the Marvel vs Capcom name as a brand of fighting game. But what is even more impressive, the best was still to come. So make sure you hit that subscribe button now to watch my upcoming 2023 video on the outrageously brilliant Marvel vs Capcom 2. Yeah, cheerio.